On today's episode, a watermelon gets smashed, Justin Allgaier can't stop wrecking, and a grown man laughs at another grown man for wearing a bandana. Welcome back to the Break Hard Show. My name is Matt. Uh, hopefully everybody had a good weekend. Obviously, if you live on the eastern side of the United States, you were probably impacted by Hurricane Helene in one way or another. If you're in Western Carolina, Eastern Tennessee, thoughts are out for you because the pictures and videos out of that region of the country look absolutely brutal. Essentially, a hurricane wi wiped out towns that were 22, 2,500 feet above sea level, which is kind of unheard of right now. Uh, it's always nice to see the racing community come together. Uh, Hendrick Motorsports, Joe Gibbs Racing, Greg Biffle, as well as you YouTuber uh, Cletus McFarlane, Garrett Mitchell, were all flying their helicopters into Western Carolina on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Uh, here's that some of them will continue to do it well into this week to deliver supplies to the Asheville area, to the Western Carolina, Eastern Tennessee areas that have been essentially cut off. I mean, you have places like Asheville, Boone. Um, there are towns that just there's no way in and no way out right now at least that's not accessible for um a lot of things to get in and out of there so teams are you know volunteering volunteering their helicopters their pilots time um supplies joe gives racing put out a tweet that if you would like to drop off supplies uh to their shop they're accepting supplies on monday and on tuesday and they will fly those supplies um to those affected that need it. Uh, Greg Biffle was out flying around as well. Like I mentioned, Cleese McFarland doing the same thing, dropping off supplies to people that are in desperate need. So it's nice to see the racing community come together for something like this, for an absolutely uh, tragic, catastrophic situation that unfolded there. All right, now trying to segue out of that is about impossible, but sports have a way of, you know, taking your mind off of things for the moment. And we had three NASCAR races this weekend, including an ARCA race on Friday night as well. I uh, had to hook up the generator so I could watch the Friday night ARCA race and truck series. If anybody tells you that they're committed to the ARCA race, ask them if they ever hooked up a generator to make sure that their television and internet could run so they could watch the ARCA race from Kansas Speedway, because uh, that's what I did. My got the lower level of the house hooked up to the generator was out. I was without power for about 36 hours, nothing like what other people are going through, um, but did make me consider buying a Generac, which I think is probably going to be a big purchase that the, that the brake car compound will be making um, in the near future. But uh, we had racing this weekend. We'll start off with the NASCAR Cup Series race this past Sunday. And like I said in the other video, Watermelon Man cometh, Watermelon Man taketh. Ross Chastain picks up his first NASCAR Cup Series victory of the season, uh, fifth of his career, tying him with Austin Dillon now. And that doesn't actually really mean anything. Ross Chastain's racked up five wins in what, three seasons. Uh, now, did not qualify for the playoffs this year. He and uh, that track house team view themselves as disruptors, like three Stanford bros talking about their latest startup, which will probably fail, uh, but they're going to be disruptors into whatever X industry that they're getting into at that moment. That's what it feels like track house says every single time. And honestly, <clears throat> I, I'm kind of tired of the disruptor thing. I like track house. I like what they're bringing to the sport. I like the youthfulness of track house. I like that they're, you know, a little bit more brash in a sense uh, with their approach to things. If you want to be a disruptor, though, you're going to have to be in the playoffs. You're going to have to be there contending for championships. You're trying. The whole point of being a disruptor is to knock the, you know, the old guard out. That being Joe is racing, Hendrick Motorsports, um, even Team Penske. They're not there yet. They have Daniel Suarez, who's frolicking around in the back portion of the playoff field. Ross Chastain didn't qualify for the playoffs. And hey, they're getting SVG next year. And they could, in theory, put three cars into the playoffs next year, which would be great. But it's hard to talk about disruptors if you're not actually contending for a championship. Yeah, you're winning a race. But like Kyle Busch isn't going to get out and be like, yeah, we're disruptors here at RCR when, you know, if he would have won that race. So, yeah, that was the only thing where I was like, oh, my gosh, we're doing this disruptor thing once again. Hey, he is a non-playoff driver. He won a playoff race. That's cool in its own right, but it's not like it hasn't happened before. It's happened a bunch of times before, in fact. So, Ross Chastain picks up his first one of the year. Awesome for him. Gets out, smashes a watermelon. Uh, I would love to see him do a Gallagher throwback with a sledge matic and just absolutely bash it. Maybe he went to Southern 500. That's what he can do then. Uh, pay a little bit of homage to uh, Gallagher. Gal the real Gallagher, not Gallagher uh, 2. Kyle Busch was in contention to win this race until 32 laps to go. He and Chase Briscoe. I shouldn't even say that. He went, to, he went to attempt to pass Chase Briscoe. Didn't work out for him. Lost the air on the front of the car. It snapped sideways. And honestly, in the Monday cooldown blog I wrote, he is just an aging driver with a skill set that's unfortunately been plagued by how this car handles this gen 7 car and he really hasn't gotten a hand on it yet yeah he does have three wins four wins technically uh in the gen uh, 7 era 
but he just he constantly wants to drive the car off the right rear, which is what he's done historically. And it, it doesn't work like that anymore. And what happened on Sunday wasn't an issue with that type of uh, driving style, which I mentioned, but he lost the front of the race car. It kind of tank slap, bounced off the wall a little bit, spins out down the back stretch. Um, he ends up finishing 19th. Chase Briscoe goes on to finish 24th. And Briscoe didn't do anything wrong. Like what he did wasn't against the rules. It was it against like driver code, maybe a little bit, uh, you know, Kyle Busch kind of mentioned that, like, you know, it used to be when the leaders were coming through in the closing laps of the race, guys just kind of got out of the way for you. And maybe you should expect, you should assume that you're going to get that level of respect, but you have a guy like Chase Briscoe who, I mean, he's been involved in incidents before. He doesn't necessarily give way you know, for lack of a better term here, uh, to the leaders or to people that are faster or, you know, he's run into people multiple times that are going for wins of the race, wrecked them. Uh, he's been involved in other incidents where it's like, ah, oh, dude, you probably could have kept your nose clean there. And again, like, can't stress enough. He didn't do anything wrong in the situation, but it's a lot like when, you know, Joey Logano on a super speedway just parks his car in the middle lane when the pack's coming and forces him to split around him so that he can disrupt that whole pack and then, you know, hopefully cling on to them. It's essentially kind of what Briscoe did here. He parked his car in that, you know, almost upper lane and basically told Kyle Busch, you can either try to shoot the gap right here or you can fall behind me and then try to pass me again, you know, in another lap or next corner, whatever it is. And Kyle took the risk of trying to shoot the gap right there and it didn't work out for him, but he had to take that risk because he had Ross Chastain behind him. So Chase Briscoe didn't do anything wrong, but the lack of respect is something that I'm sure Kyle Busch and others will certainly remember. And Kyle Busch's spotter, Derek Nealon, was not happy about it. And he went down to the 14 spotter. And this is what he said over the eight radio. He said he went down to the 14 spotter and said, we could have effing ran through you at Darlington, essentially being like, show us some respect in the situation here. But Kyle Busch ends up spinning out. Rasha Sang goes on to win the race. Martin Drex Jr. looked like he was in contention to win in his final season. And then that just ended up not happening uh, for for him, we'll have to wait and see if he gets one, you know, before the end of the year. But that was his first top five finish since the Kansas Spring Race back in May. Just an absolutely brutal stretch of run for Martin Truex Jr. Then you have Kyle Larson. Uh, obviously, last week, he was the talking point leading forward in 62 of 500 laps at Darlington. Or not Darlington, at Bristol. Jeez, old Pete, 500 laps at Darlington would take forever. Uh, what, 267 laps there? Was it 267? Somewhere in that range. Takes a long time. Uh Two, three, five hundred or five hundred laps. That would be absolutely brutal. You're talking about like a eight hour race at that point. The NASCAR eight hours of Darlington. Um, Larson cuts a tire down. Uh, lap twenty gets into the wall, brings out a caution, and it didn't destroy the car. Didn't bend a towing. Tow was right on it and everything. But the underbody of the car got messed up. The diffuser got messed up, and Cliff Daniels and the team tried to get it back together. And Larson essentially just kept complaining on the radio. He's like, I don't have speed to keep up with these guys. Like he said, it's at one point he said, it's kind of scary just getting blown past by, by people that are coming by him. And uh, the car just got really draggy and it just did not have any straightaway speed. So what could have been a really bad day ended up being an uh, uh, minimized damage type of day. He came home 26, uh, is still has a pretty good cushion above the cut line, but Kansas is the best racetrack for him in this second round. Now going to or Talladega, where he doesn't do very well at. And then the Roval, not exactly the way Kyle Larson kind of dreamed up his round two going, but they minimize the amount of damage. Then you have uh, Denny Hamlin after the race. I thought this was really interesting. Denny Hamlin comes home with a top five finish and you know gets out of the car afterwards, and he's like, we should have won this race. We're the fastest car on the racetrack. Uh, at times they were definitely the fastest car on the racetrack. Uh, Ty Gibbs was very fast as well. Uh, but you know, he said every time we would pit, we'd pit in third and come out 15th and have to work their way back up there. Jeff Gluck asked him about being mentally, you know, in this game, like what's this doing for you mentally? And Denny Hamlin had a very interesting quote where he said, he said, quote, I'm not in it mentally. I can tell you that there's a lot of wires crossed and bolts loose at the moment, but what can you do? I'll just do the best I can to drive the car and do my part. Honestly, it's a pretty glaring or admission by Denny Hamlin. Clearly, things aren't going well for him. Uh, there's a lot on his plate. The start of the playoffs has been brutal for him. It looked like he may not transfer out of the first round, even. Obviously, he had a good run at Bristol, so he manages to, to advance. Uh, had a good run at Kansas, too, but had a car that was capable of winning this race. 
And maybe it's all the charter negotiations going on. Maybe it's the future 2311 racing. Will they have charters at the end of the year? What's going to happen uh, there? Obviously, they want to add a third car. He's got a lot on his plate from the team owner side of things. Now, on the driver side of things, he obviously got that big penalty uh, because of the Toyota mishap where they didn't send his engine to NASCAR to be torn down before they sent it back to Costa Mesa to be torn down. And it could just be a number of things for Denny at this point. But it's been up and down for him but he started off the round two really well with a solid finish there now he heads to Talladega where he of course is strong in the Gen 7 car he has not been as strong as he once was on super speedways and then he goes to the Roval which will be a lot about surviving for him uh because I don't think he's the guy that we're going to consider to be a contender at the Roval but for Denny talking about the mental side of things and him being like yeah I'm not mentally here um it's just you know surprising honestly uh to have a guy be that sort of forthcoming and you know admitting that he's just not mentally in it right now for the cup series though the playoff point standings after the first race of the second round sees tyler reddick he went into the day plus 20 exits minus four points uh so he's four points below the cutoff line daniel suarez 14 points below the cutoff line chase briscoe 25 points below the cutoff line and austin cendrick 29 points below that cutoff line honestly uh the bottom three 10th 11th and 12th uh Suarez Briscoe and Cendric that's I think who everybody probably expected to be out in this round and you know realistically Austin Cendric has scored the most points amongst all drivers on super speedways this year unless he has a good if he has a bad Talladega he's done he's out uh, barring a must-win scenario at the Roval. Chase Briscoe, I would argue he's in another situation a lot like that. Um, unless he gets out of Talladega unscathed, I think that he's probably on his way out. Daniel Suarez, I don't have much faith in him advancing out of this round with both of those racetracks coming up. The ne- this is where it gets interesting. Chase Elliott and Joey Logano are both tied for plus four above the cutoff line. Tyler Reddick, minus four. A lot of what's going to decide this playoff or this round is going to happen this weekend in Talladega. Joey Logano has a really good shot of winning this weekend. So does Chase Elliott. So does Alex Bowman. So does Tyler Reddick. He won here back in the springtime. Whoever survives Talladega this weekend out of those four, probably Bowman, Elliott, Logano, and Reddick will be the ones that advance on more than likely. Um, Anybody that has issues this weekend going into the Roval, they're probably going to be in a must-win situation, especially with the way road courses have been raced this year. And... It'll be interesting to see how exactly they come out of this. But William Byron currently leads the points, plus 34 over the cutoff line. Uh, Ryan Blaney, plus 28. Chris Rubel, plus 28. Kyle Larson, plus 18. Larson gave up, um, what, about 21 points, essentially, over the cutoff line uh, this this weekend. Can't afford to have a bad Talladega out of that. Denny Hamlin is plus 11. So, uh, cutoff line is going to be real tight going into Talladega, and those guys all have to be hoping that something bad does not happen to them. Moving on to the Xfinity Series, he gets us to victory lane. Big Religion had to be super psyched on Saturday when Eric Almirola picked up his second NASCAR Xfinity Series win of the season. This is only the second time in Eric Almirola's career he's won two races in the same season in the same series. The other time came in 2010 in the NASCAR Truck Series. Uh, For Almirola, big time win for him. He got out of the car after the race and he said, yeah, you know, I've had a friend go through me. Oh, chill. Eric, we don't be saying things like that out in public. Uh, Honestly, it was about a friend that's been going through it. He was there in Kansas to celebrate. He quickly, um, you know, cleaned up his his misspoke there, misspeak, and and did it. But in the moment, I was like, geez, Eric, we don't need to have that out in public here. Uh, Justin Allgaier, stop crashing. If you keep crashing, you're not going to win a championship. Allgaier is desperate to win a title. At this point, he's become like the Elliott Sadler of not winning titles, the Mark Martin of not winning titles, the Denny Hamlin of the Xfinity Series when it comes to not winning a championship. And the dude just won't stop wrecking. Yeah, you can argue that he's putting himself in bad positions. He's getting maybe a little bit aggressive, everything and anything under the sun. At the end of the day, you got to stop crashing. And he crashed again this weekend, and it took a big hit for him in the point standings. Stop it. That's what you need to do. Stop crashing. That is the key to the game uh, here. Connor Zilich won in his first ever NASCAR Xfinity Series start uh, a couple weeks ago at Watkins Glen, and his second ever NASCAR Xfinity Series start finishes P4, back-to-back top five finishes, like he's uh, Carson Quapple from earlier in the year. Maybe there's some Carson Quapple news coming as well for JRM. They kind of released a teaser on Saturday as well. But Connor Zilich is going to be an absolute problem next year in that number 88 car for Junior Motorsports. Um, yeah, he's... 
he's good. He's just really good, especially for a kid that really hasn't raced on mile and a half. Uh, what does he have an ARCA start at Kansas and an ARCA start at Michigan to really try to understand the air? And he finishes P4 in his first ever extended start on an intermediate. Yeah, I would say that he's probably um, pretty good. Shane Van Gisbergen, obviously has three wins this season. He's in the playoffs. And I think everybody would have said Kansas is probably going to be the track that he struggles with the most in the uh, start of the Xfinity Series uh, playoffs in their first opening round, which consists of uh, Kansas, Talladega, and the Charlotte Roval. He got out of Kansas with a top 10 finish, a P8 finish. He currently sits plus seven over the cutoff line. He heads into Talladega now where he looks pretty comfortable in the races that we've seen this year. I mean, heck, he was leading the high line uh, in, the, in the cup race back in the springtime before all that went uh, haywire. If he can survive Talladega, he goes to the Roval, and I would say that he's definitely the favorite to win at the Roval, he and A.J. Allmendinger. Uh, yeah, a, uh, Shane Van Gisbergen could be advancing on into the playoffs in his first ever appearance, which would be absolutely massive for him. Friday night, Truck Series race. Corey Heim. I'll say it. Nobody else would say it. I'll say it. Corey Heim, he's really good. So is Christian Eckes. Before all the Christian disciples come at me and tell me that he's just as good as Corey Heim, I'm with you. I'm with you that he's just as good as Corey Heim. But Corey Heim uh, is, is really good as well. Top prospect for me in NASCAR right now. Uh, Heim picks up his sixth win of the year. Daniel Dye. Ben Rhodes, they go no further. They were both eliminated from the playoffs. Daniel Dye uh, got into the wall, had a tire go down early in that race, and coming back from that was going to be really difficult. Ben Rhodes, car, truck, truck, would just not do anything that he wanted on Friday night. So just brutal nights for both of them. Corey Day was challenging for a top 10 in his second ever NASCAR Truck Series uh, start and was racing Matt Mills down the backstretch when Matt Mills decided to go all family guy. I turn right now and just turn right in the middle of the backstretch there. Um, hooked Dan or Corey Day, put him into the wall. For Corey Day, though, uh, there's a lot to be happy about from his Friday. He finished P4 in the ARCA race. He finished, was in you know, had a chance at a top 10 in his second ever truck series start. Those were only his fifth and sixth starts ever on pavement, I believe. So the fact that he's catching on this quickly, the ARCA race, he was a little bit like Connor Mozak before Connor kind of, you know, figured out how to race on ovals. He was a bit of a missile out there at times, but a lot of it's just understanding how the air works on the car, getting loose underneath people. Had a great save in the ARCA race too, where you're like, yeah, that's where the kid's car control uh, can absolutely shine at in a situation like that. After the ARCA race, um, on a late restart, he got into it with Andy, uh, Andy, sorry, Jankowiak, I believe is his name, Andy J, as uh, TJ Majors refers to him as. And after the race, Andy came down to him because Corey used him up, definitely used him up on that restart. Corey ends up finishing P4, Andy down in the teens. Andy comes over to him, and as he walked over to Corey Day, Corey smirked at him when he looked up and saw, because I think he smirked at a grown man wearing a bandana tied around his head, like in an unironic way. And I think that's what he was smirking at. And it, you know, I don't think it made Andy very happy because I believe he told TV afterwards, he was like, we're racing Hendrick. I got ran over by a Hendrick car. I get it. I get what Andy's saying there in that situation. Corey definitely drove over his head. Um, but yeah, it was just a funny moment when you see uh, Corey look up and he's like, kind of laughs at him. Bandanas, nobody can really pull off Ben Dana look. I mean, unless you're Hulk Hogan, but for the most part, most people, can't really pull that off. All right, now it's time for the break hard power hour, the voicemail, the hotline. It will not be an hour. It'll probably be more like 10 minutes, but I appreciate everybody that calls in and leaves a voicemail. If you want to call in, leave me a voicemail. It is 513-445-9809. Let's get into it. Hey, Matt. Tony Southwell calling from Australia, former driver in the Australian NASCAR championship. I think that a lot of um, NASCAR fans in the States need to start to understand that NASCAR isn't just about them anymore. It hasn't been for a long time. I, I can't remember a time when we didn't get NASCAR live in Australia. And now with this new $8 billion deal that's been signed and it's going out to 150 countries live, um, NASCAR fans in the States need to know that it's, a, it's global now. It's not about... Ben Kennedy doesn't care about NASCAR fans in the States as much as they used to. Now they want it to be global. And I think fans don't get that. They don't, they, when I see their comments and I see their message, what they say about NASCAR, and they just don't seem to get that it's, it's a global thing now. It's all over the world. Um, also, 
SVG, I think, is doing a great job, but I, but I really think that his supercar fans' expectations of him are far too great. They seem to think that he um, can achieve far more than he probably will, which is a bit unrealistic. Anyway, mate, been watching your show since you first started. Uh, like it. Good work. See you, mate. Bye. Break Hart has gone international. Thanks for calling in. Tony, appreciate it. We've, we've reached down under. Um, appreciate the kind words as well. So what Tony's saying there, he's not wrong in, the term, in terms of NASCAR definitely paying more attention to the international audience. NASCAR knows that there are fans around the world that like the NASCAR Cup Series, a lot like the NFL. Yeah, you have your various NASCAR series around the country, around the world, Brazil, Canada, Europe, Europe and stuff like that but they're interested in the NASCAR Cup Series. It's like when NFL Europe existed. Yeah, you can watch NFL football be played in Europe, but it's not the stars of the NFL. And that's what they're seeing here with NASCAR. That's why they're going to Mexico next year. That's why they've had conversations and explorations to other areas to potentially have cup races at. Do I ever think that they'll be able to go internationally mid-season? Probably not, barring like, you know, an Olympic year where there's going to be like a two week break or something like that happening. I don't think that that's going to to happen. You're talking about moving 36 cars and a lot of equipment around. And I, I just don't think that that's going to be possible. Canada, Mexico. Yeah, those are ones that you can drive to the ones that you can, you know, pair with other races in the United States, something like that. But could we see like, you know, the NASCAR stars doing like an exhibition race in Australia, like they've done in the past or Japan or something like that. Yeah. I think that's absolutely going to happen at some point in uh, the future. So for, for what Tony's saying here is yeah, Ben Kennedy, does he care as much about fans in the United States? Yeah, he still cares. He absolutely cares, but he's also paying attention to what's happening, you know, in other areas. That's what everybody in NASCAR is doing, right? At the end of the day, this is a money. This is all about money and it's about where you can make the most money at as well. So seeing NASCAR expand internationally, not really a surprise there. Um, on the SVG point as well, Australian supercar fans hold SVG to this like godlike status. He's going to come over and wax all Americans. Americans don't know how to drive everything and, you know, anything. I think SVG is one of the most talented race car drivers in the world. Duke can win in absolutely anything that he gets into, and he's done exactly that. But some of the level that people hold him to, it's like, all right, calm, calm down. Uh, is he ever going to win a NASCAR Cup Series title? Probably not. But he is a guy that is definitely going to win on an oval at some point in his career. Uh, just the progression that we've seen this year in the Xfinity series from when he first started to now, this guy absolutely is understanding oval racing. He knows what he's looking for in a race car now, and he's got a good feel for it. Now he's moving to the cup series next year, different car, different suspension, different tire, everything like that. He's going to have to kind of relearn everything, but that's why they're giving him starts at the end of this year uh, on an oval uh, for that college team and that 16 car on loan from track house, of course. But yeah, he's really good. So appreciate you calling in, Tony. Appreciate the uh, kind words as well. This is Ray from London, Ohio. Love your show. But I just want to talk about all these alliances like Gibbs, 2311, Penske, Wood Brothers, Spire, and Hendrick. Why don't they just rename it the Manufacturer Series and just have all Chevy V1 team, all Fords, all Toyotas, because that's what it's become. It should be individual like it used to be years ago. I was wanting your opinion on that because I know we got to have change in NASCAR, but I just want to know your opinion about that. Thank you. Thanks for calling in, uh, Ray from Ohio. Yeah, so the talk of alliances. I'm sure people are probably getting tired of this by now. We have the, you know, potential Hendrick Spire Alliance, the RCR Colleague Alliance, the RFK in Haas Factory, RFK uh, Rick Ware Racing, RFK Front Row Motorsport <laughs> Alliance. There's a lot of alliances, Wood Brothers and Team Penske as well. 2311, Joe Gibbs Racing. So is it ever going to be just like a manufacturer versus manufacturer type of series? No, that's not going to happen because these teams are still very rooted in wanting the team aspect of this. Now, teams are still very much rooted in like wanting the team aspect of this, um, which is never going to change. You know, Hendrick Motorsports still wants to beat the crap out of Trackhouse and, and RCR and 2311 Racing still wants to beat the crap out of Legacy and stuff like that. So I don't think we're ever going to see, you know, just straight up manufacturer versus manufacturer. Um, but yeah, the reliance on alliances right now is 
you know, increasing because these smaller teams want to run better. They don't necessarily have the capital or the people to be able to do that. But if they do an alliance and are able to, you know, work with a bigger team, that means that they're going to get some better people down on their end of things, whether that's engineers, um, crew chiefs, over the wall guys, whoever, sometimes even drivers to try to help elevate their program. And for that bigger team, it allows them to, you know, put their other people down into a smaller team, get them real world experience, and then be able to move them up, you know, if they ever have an opening or something like that. So for both sides, it works out pretty well for this whole alliance thing. Hey, it's John from Florida. Today's race was pretty rough again for Legacy Motor Club. It's like every time Jimmy Johnson's been in that car this year, he's just been awful and hasn't finished higher than what, like 28th? since he's been back. And that got me thinking, John Hunter Nemechek, he was doing really well at Xfinity, but then he moved up to Legacy and hasn't done anything in Cup yet with that. So uh, if John Hunter Nemechek stayed in Xfinity for one more year with Gibbs, do you think he would have been in line to get the 19 from Truex next year when he retires? Thanks, bye. John from Florida brings up a great point about Legacy Motor Club. They are incredibly slow right now. Like they just don't seem to have it at all. And this is a team I think we were all expecting to maybe take a step up when they switched over to Toyota, uh, you know, as their manufacturer for the 2024 season. And they just haven't had it at all. Now they don't get the same Toyota support that a 2311 racing and Joe Gibbs racing uh, get. Uh, and they don't have an alliance with either of them. So there's no open book there. But Jimmy Johnson has looked like a shell of his former self. Every now and then in practice, you'll see like a glimpse of like, okay, that's like the old Jimmy Johnson there. But remember when Kevin Harvick said that, you know, Jimmy had a lucky horseshoe shut up his ass. And that's why he uh, went on that run, won so many races, won so many championships. That horseshoe is long gone. It is at the bottom of the Atlantic and it is never to be found again or where, whatever, whatever, whatever body of water you want to put it at the bottom of because he just has no luck anymore whatsoever. Now, John Hunter Nemechek. If he waited another year, could he have been in line for that 19 seat at Joggers Racing? Yeah, probably. But at the same time, you don't know if Martin's going to extend on for another year. And John Hunter can't base his future around whether or not Martin Truex Jr. is going to retire. Now, as he sits back, he's probably like, dang it, I probably should have, you know, tried to find more budget for another year in Xfinity and then had you know, maybe a shot at that Joe Gibbs racing ride, but who knows, maybe Gibbs still would have gone, you know, outside of their network and signed Chase Briscoe. That remains to be seen, but yeah, John Hunter is probably not having a great time right now. Hey, Rick Hart, it's Nathan from Indiana. Uh, so I wanted to talk about uh, something that probably didn't get talked about like, during the race, really. It was when Josh Berry was involved in that first lap crash. Uh, he they just forced him to get out of the car, like, when he probably could have just been towed back to his pit and could have still continued to race. I was wondering, like, you know, what do you think of the DVP and, you know, how NASCAR should handle guys, you know, not being able to drive back or if they can still be in the race? Yeah, they just left Josh Berry in the campground. They just straight up dropped him in the campground. He was in the race for a whole, like, 17 seconds, gets hooked up, dropped in the campground. All because he had four flat tires from getting spun out in a wreck that wasn't even his wreck. And now NASCAR has been consistent on this. They absolutely have been. I can't really complain about that. But it's just a kind of a flaw with this car. When you don't have any sidewall, you have the wheel setup that they currently have with an underbody and diffuser. When you blow all four tires out, you're just kind of beached there like a whale or a seal or something on the beach. Turtle, even. And you're welcome for the waddle. And you're kind of stuck. And then you get hooked up to the tr or to the tow truck, your day's done. And that sucks because it shouldn't be. Back in the day, you would have just driven back to pit road. And now your day is over for some very minor damage on the you know rear bumper of that car and four flat tires. And your whole day is for nothing. So I don't think it's going to change unless it affects a playoff guy. Then we could maybe see something happening in the future. But NASCAR has been consistent on it, so you can't really get upset about that. But maybe it's something you look at. But then it's like, oh, it becomes a judgment call. And we, do we want more judgment calls in NASCAR? I would argue no at the moment. But yeah, it's definitely a bummer to see something like that happen. So appreciate everybody that called in uh, this week. The guy from Connecticut that called in, um, I went to put yours in. All the recording get, got messed up. I had to go back and re-record this whole segment. Uh, so you did not make it in the second time. Uh, I, I get what you're saying, though. And I'll try to work it in uh, next week as well. But... Moving on to what's on TV this week.
week on Friday, 1 p.m. FS2 is Truck Series qualifying for Talladega. At 4.30 p.m. on Friday is the Truck Series race from Talladega on Friday, FS1. Yeah, it probably should have been a doubleheader on Saturday with the Xfinity Series race, but college football exists. FS1 is going to be carrying college football all day on Saturday. So Friday night, 4.30, afternoon, evening, 4.30, FS1. On Saturday at noon, USA is Xfinity Series qualifying. 1.30, USA Cup Series qualifying, 4 p.m. on Saturday, Xfinity Series race on the CW. I understand some people don't get the CW, or they do, but their affiliate isn't showing NASCAR. I think it's probably because of the late decision to move the final eight races over to the CW. Some local affiliates had already scheduled other programming, should hopefully be cleared up uh, when the season comes back in February at Daytona. I get it. It sucks. I've seen the tweets. I've seen the post. It's unfortunate um, that your local affiliate maybe isn't carrying it right now, uh, but everybody does get the CW. Just depends on if your local affiliate's carrying it uh, for the remainder of the season. Then on Sunday, 2 p.m. on NBC, the NASCAR Cup Series race from Talladega, all green flag laps will be shown live on television. Yes, they might go side by side, but you will not lose a single lap of green flag coverage. Uh, I get it. People are going to be like, well, I saw an ad. You did. It's side by side, though. They'll only go full screen commercial during a caution break, during the stage break. So you will not miss a single lap of green flag racing on Sunday. All right. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in this week. Let me know in the comments what you thought about the show, um, the racing this past weekend, the voicemails. Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at Break Hard, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Break Hard Blog.